Uh, this is Occupolitics, a podcast about the wizarding world that has also at pivotal moments documented our disenchantment with the author, the United States' continual descent into collective madness, the transformation of white supremacist undertones from being the white noise most Americans placidly ignored into a tune with all the subtlety of a death metal band. No disrespect to death metal, it's just the best I could come up with. <laughs> As always, I'm Adri, one of your hosts, a recovering English major looking for a support group, and a person carrying the myriad burdens and expectations placed on me as a child by my mother and the spookiest of specter parents, colonialism. I'm Helene, your producer, one of your hosts, and at this point, a mere shell of a functioning human being. Hey, y'all. I'm Kay Alex, your co-host and resident ABW. And if you don't know what ABW stands for, this podcast is probably not for you. Can I guess? Or is this like not a guessing game? Sure. Take a guess. Is it angry black woman? Period. Okay. Well, I'm here to hype us up. (laughs) Take a shot every time I use the air horn sound. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes fun drinking game yeah i don't think i don't think that's a responsible drinking game but this episode does come out on the spookiest of days three days before election day and also halloween <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness love it uh, i mean the spookiest part of it is is definitely the election tension as i'm calling it oh 100 percent. yeah that's all i can think about Today, we're going to be delving into chapter 12 of Harry Potter and One Order of the Phoenix. And the title of this chapter and some of its characters is also Professor Umbridge. (laughs) How did I not guess you would have a sound effect for that? (laughs) You know, like my new goal in life is to continue adding sound effects that delight you. Uh, please, please do. Uh, they make my life slightly better than before, and that's all that anyone can ask for. This is the one with the have a biscuit potter scene. That should be enough. Or, I guess, in other words, this is the one where the trio attend their first classes of their fifth year, and Harry stands up to Umbridge trying to spread lies in her defense against the dark arts class. Before we get into the intricacies of this, uh, Interesting chapter. It's time for us to give a shout out to our newest patron. Yeah. Our newest patron is Patricia Ferran. Thank you for your support. Every little bit counts so that we can keep this podcast alive and uploaded. We have an extra segment on today's episode that is just for patrons. We're talking about our theories of how a girl, Neville, may have impacted how we think of this character and how others think of this character. The patriarchy is everywhere, y'all. But before we delve into the nitty-gritty of this chapter, it's time for our Potter Watch segment, where we discuss some of the latest news in the United States. Potter Watch is uh, it's getting uh, spookier and spookier every week, I swear. Well, we're getting ridiculously close to Election Day. Um, I was... You know, just talking to my family earlier, and I was like, have you sat down and thought about the fact that in one week from today, we might know who the president is? We might not know, because, you know. I mean, spoiler alert, it's going to be a white guy, but. Yeah, yeah. that's a big spoiler. Wow, thanks for ruining that for everybody. (laughs) (laughs) But, I mean, like, we might not know, even though a week from, like, even when we're recording or when this comes out, um, you know the ballots might not have all been counted since so many people did mail-in voting and early voting and there's a lot of balance to ballots to be counted. So we might, this is like going to be a weird year where we might not actually know who wins on election night, but I mean, if it means that we get a fair election with a fair outcome where everybody's vote is counted, I'm fine with that. I just need to know. Well, that goes into very neatly into what I wanted to talk about real quick before we go into like the bad stuff. 
A glimmer of hope, maybe? Question mark. Voting turnout has shattered records.、Uh, over 64 million people, as of October 27th, which was yesterday, as of recording, have already voted. 31.1 million of those people are in battleground states, including my adopted home state of Texas. Compared to 2016, Texas has cast over 80% of total ballots in that year. And it's not even, you know, November. Election、day. day, yeah. yeah. And especially, like, I think the people are expecting that the people who actually turn up on election day are going to be people who are voting for Trump. And so that is usually in Texas, that's a big. Like part of the state. So it's interesting. We also have two more, two million、uh, more registered voters than we did in 2016. So that's going to be really interesting. A lot of those two million、uh, regist- new registered voters are young voters and Hispanic voters who skew statistically Democrat. So we'll see what happens there. So 24 million votes have been cast and likely Biden wins states and 9.2 million. Votes have been cast in likely Trump state wins. This low number might also be because there's not a lot of early voting in those like, likely、uh, Trump state winners because, you know, voter suppression. Fun. Yeah. And just like the principle of now, I feel like Republicans are just like, I'm going to vote on election day out of principle now because it's a Democrat thing to do to vote early and to vote by mail in ballot. Oh, whatever they want to do, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, stay safe, everyone, as you vote if you haven't voted already. But、um, speaking of spooky, bad stuff, we got a new Supreme Court judge, I guess.、Mm. Yes, we did. And guess what she's looking at in her first week? Uh, bad things. <laughs> things, that, things that I'm not convinced she's going to、uh, rule on the correct side on. Oh, yeah. Including, you know, th- trivial things like Trump's taxes, the election. Oh, you know, just the election. And, and you know, abortion cases. Oh, my goodness. Yay.、Uh, yeah.、Mm. But the Girl Scouts think she's amazing. Isn't that wonderful? Motherfucker. Like, do I have to stop eating Girl Scout cookies now? Like, why? Oh, yeah, girl. Like, people have already started posting on Twitter their homemade recipes for Samoas, thin mints, all types well, of stuff. Also, because s- Samoas are like a little bit of a problematic name for a cookie, but yes, continue. <laughs> They're called something else now. I can't.、Uh, re- no, no, no. So, so, so、uh, I, I've got,、uh, I've got some,、uh, some knowledge here to drop. In certain states, depending on、um, which factory makes the cookies, they are called Samoa still. Other states call them Caramel Delights, but that's because they're from two different factories. Oh, yeah. And I've always thought that was weird because I was like, isn't the cookie mostly coconut? But. Anyway, call them what they are toasted coconut caramel and fudge. Like, whatever. Wow, you know that off the top of your head. <laughs>、um, I ate, I, I'm a connoisseur <laughs> of Girl Scout cookies, if you will.、I'm、I、sorry. mean, I <laughs> also used to be a Girl Scout, but apparently they decided to celebrate. I don't even like giving her an acronym because I do not, because she's not RGB. Yes. No, and she's not、o- AOC either. Like, only cool women get their names acronyms. It's also it's R, it's,、um, RBG, not RGB. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm drinking wine. It's fine. <laughs> I, I'm drinking wine. I have Adobe Illustrator open. Same thing. The newest white woman who got a job she wasn't qualified for, they decided that that was like a yes. A you go girl moment, and everybody was like, Girl, you tripping? And y'all cookies not that great. And I was like, Ooh, dang. And so then they decided to clap back, and then they decided to delete that and the clap back. But you know, screenshots are forever. So, Girl Scouts, delete your account, man. First, you can't. Can't, can't buy popcorn because the Boy Scouts are creepy. You can't buy cookies because the Girl Scouts are like the 53%. I have a hot take anyway because I have never liked Girl Scout cookies. 
<laughs> I don't think like I, when I like eat a cookie, I want it to be warm and gooey and fresh out of the oven. And Girl Scout cookies are always so hard, and I never really fell for them. So there's you can you, you can do better by making cookies in your own house anyway. Just make your own cookies. I mean to eat to eat their own, but how are your taste buds so woke? Thin mint. <laughs> They're meant to bang in the freezer. You can't tell me that they don't. I, as somebody who sold them and purchased them, I, it's it's about don't sweat the technique. I always felt like so weird for not liking them because every single person I know likes them. My sister was obsessed with Thin Mints growing up. I never really cared for them, and I was like, "Am I weird? I think I'm weird." Twenty twenty is taking everything away from me. It is. It really, I, I feel like it's personal at this point. Like, this is the line. Oh, yeah. It's totally personal. And speaking of personal, I I just have to be your resident ABW at this moment. Like, I'm not going to let this podcast go by without speaking Walter Wallace's name into the universe. He's yet another victim of police brutality and white supremacy in America. And... I don't want to see another photo of a Walmart being looted. I don't want to hear about rioting and looting. It's not protesting. I want the police gone. I want ref- I want defundment. I don't want reform. I don't I don't want to hear about shitty mental health takes. I don't want to hear about oh the system can be turned in turn right from the inside out, like, no, spare me your bullshit. I'm tired of Black lives not mattering. I'm tired of inanimate objects and billion-dollar corporations that literally steal from their workers right under their noses, being prioritized over our blood, our sweat, and our tears for this country that we built. And I have been living under a rock is what I have been doing since Monday. Because I did not know about any of this. Look at me and my privilege. Walter Wallace was murdered. 27-year-old black man. Mother pleaded with the police in Philly to because he uh, suffered from bipolar disorder. And he had a knife. But I'm like, you have a taser. You have guns. You have hours and hours and hours of de-escalation training, according to Blue Lives Matter. And yet you feel like 14 shots to the body are the perfect remedy for someone who's basically harmless. You have all this riot gear, you have all the protection of America, and yet 14 shots to the body. That is fucking insane. My goodness. Let's let's keep going through the 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 white supremacy in America bingo, shall we? Cops on desk duty, of course. Body cam footage shaky, of course. Video, yeah, of course. When you have a system that is so corrupt and rotten, like how do you you, you can't fix that from the inside? Like there are there are so many cases of you know mass murders where these men go and shoot up a movie theater and they claim mental illness and they're alive today oh yeah they you know they go and take them to burger king on the way to the police station and from what i've seen of this story and sadly that's all it is right now is a story because that's what our lives get turned into, stories. His family called the called for a, emergency services because we also need to realize that when we are oftentimes dialing 911, we are not looking for the police. Exactly. Mm-hmm. The police just happen to be the first people to show up, probably because they're the most anxious to actually ruin somebody's day and kill someone. It just... I don't have I don't I don't have any like it is hard to talk about politics in America when America still sees me as three fifths of a person. 
It is hard to talk about politics in America when people are still debating about whether or not voting for Kanye West, when people are still talking about, oh, the electoral votes versus the popular vote. This man is literally two years younger than me, and he won't live to see another vote. He won't live to see another trial. He won't live to see even the birth of his kid. Damn what the rest of America got going on. Like Our lives are on the line at this point, and I really don't want to debate with anybody who or uh, talk to anybody who doesn't really see that, like, this is not just about which white man gets to be in charge. This is not about which side of the aisle gets another point in their cap. This is about not only the almost 300,000 people that are dying in a global pandemic, but this is also about the thousand of Americans who die every year because the fraternal order of the American police department, how fucking lame, I I shouldn't say the word lame because the word lame is a slur against people with disabilities. How fucking disgusting are you to where your job is literally known as a fraternity? Well, you know, like the thing about a fraternity that is that it implies no personal responsibility. So and that's it why implies they do it. protection, and it implies mm-hmm. that everyone inside is exclusively protecting you, which is why the- there's no accountability. These two cops with no names are on desk duty until an investigation. All the all the triggering language, all the buzzwords from every single case, from Philando Castile to Trayvon Martin to Breonna Taylor to Sandra Bland, it doesn't end. It doesn't stop. The only thing that changes is the name, the hashtag, the the number of statistics of Americans that get shot by police, the number of black people that get shot by police. That's the only thing that changes. The system does not change. The country has not changed. And it needs to. Badly. Quickly. I don't think it will until there's personal and professional accountability for each person. And even then, even then, I mean, like, you can't fix, quote, a system from within that's corrupt. You can't change figureheads and change a culture of of just... Like, it's like gang culture. You know what I mean? And that's why abolish the police is a thing. Exactly. I'm just I'm just here for it because at this point, I'm going to be the, the millionth person to tell you, don't just go vote, but vote with the mindset of, do I vote for white supremacy or no? Yeah. Well, and also our job doesn't end with voting, right? Like our vo- like our job is not every four years we show up and we vote. No. That's no. not it. And like people have said, if people put the same energy into local elections that they do for presidential elections. Oh my God, yes. Actually turn around. If people cared about their school board and their city council and their- And their judges. And their church. Yeah. And their secretary of state and- Department of Ed. Hell, if you even if you if you cared more about who was running your Girl Scout troop, you might get some results. Ugh, dismantle everything is what I say, and build it up better. Anyway, things that are not getting better: COVID numbers. There's been a surge in COVID numbers, and as the weather gets colder and drier, the theory is that the virus gets more stable in the air, which means it can spread farther and stay stable for longer periods of time. So that's a fun thing. That's not terrifying at all. (sighs) So be careful, everyone. Wear a mask. Abolish the police. You know, normal stuff. All right, it's time for uh, us to 
maybe get a pep in our step and have a friendly debate, a 30 second debate on politics in this chapter in the segment we call Hogwarts Debate Club. Okay, Alex, you're first this week. Let me know when you're ready. I think I'm ready. All right. Three, two, one, go. The politic of calculating strategy against gaslighting and manipulation. Harry struggles to maintain his wits and see that the... It's basically a game, again, of chestnut checkers. The ministry gaslighting and manipulating him, as well as the media manipulating him into using his, losing his cool uh, as he realizes that nobody believes. Will you Who shut up, person? All right. Thank you so much. Yours was the politic of gaslighting and? Calculation. Calculation. Thanks. That sounds great. Who is next? Is it me or is it? Wait. It's, it's you, Adrian. It's me. Okay. And the politics of inculcation via education. Education has long been a tool of indoctrination and colonization. You can't colonize an unwilling people, after all. In this chapter, we see the trio back at school. But with Umbridge's class, it becomes clear that what's on the curriculum and the practice thereof is based on someone's opinion and can be molded to fit an ideal. That begs the question, what if troll wars weren't covered? What if Umbridge taught history? What then? Would you shut up, man? All right. And that was The Politics of Inculcation via Education from yours truly, Adri. Helene, let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. All right. Three, two, one, go. The Politics of Loyalty. Loyalty is apparent throughout everywhere in this chapter. We see it from Dean's loyalty to shame to his friendship with Seamus um, by trying to stay out of his, out of their fight between Seamus and Harry. We see it between Mon- McGonagall and Harry after Umbridge sends Harry to her during her class. We see Umbridge lo- Umbridge's loyalty to Fudge in the Ministry over everything else. Harry's loyalty to Cedric in the truth. And the twins' loyalty to Harry when questioned about where they got hit their money to start their business. Ron's loyalty to Would his you brothers. Shut up, man. You've got great loyalty examples there. <laughs> My loyal Hufflepuff. Yes. Chapter's dripping with loyalty. What an on-brand politic. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So, I and I don't think this will qualify as a redo, but uh, I think, and this might just be about, like, how we said before about how different houses see things, but I saw all of those examples as calculation and strategy. The twins had a strategy to leave Hogwarts early, and now they have a strategy about building their business. Dean has a strategy of how he can actually just stay out of white men's issues. Hermione understands the strategy of Umbridge's game, and McGonagall does as well. The only person that doesn't seem to understand these strategies is Harry himself, because he's the one in the thick of it. And when McGonagall even asks him at the end, like, do you understand the strategies that are at play? He has to repeat what Hermione said to him. <laughs> and it it seems as if everybody is strategizing against something in the chapter, or strategizing to be in a be- better position to go against something. Well, I think that the motivation, though, is maybe the loyalty they feel towards their cause. So Umbridge strategizing um, in her way is from her uh, loyalty to the ministry and to the cause of the ministry. And Professor McGonagall feels loyalty to Dumbledore and Harry's cause. So she's like like trying to explain the strategy to Harry so he doesn't fall into Umbridge's clutches and the ministry's clutches. Like I'm, all I'm saying is like you're both right. Yeah, no, I, I like that uh, seeing it from that different different perspective. I I think that there are definitely both aspects at work here. And one, I think strategy is more thought based and takes a lot more planning, obviously strategy planning, uh, and like conscious thought and loyalty can kind of just be blind. Like people can act out of loyalty without 
having a plan in place or even anticipating what might happen from their actions. But people who act out of strategy are more likely to have thought it through, but their motivation can still be loyalty. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Though I really don't, uh, of course, like I don't have any love towards Umbridge. I do like the piece of text that describes her as an unknown quantity. I, I find that really interesting and it's a it's a way to describe a lot of a lot of the intrigue that is happening within the chapter like everybody's anticipating the move of someone else and they don't really know what that next move is going to be but they have to be prepared for it anyway whether it's quidditch whether it's building your business whether it's the exams whether it's your own mental health as you're gaslit about the dark wizard that you saw and fought. (laughs) Um, It's like, there are just so many unknown quantities that are headed into the future of the book that you're, that you're just wondering like, okay, whose next move is about to be the best move. Yeah, I always find uh, these, these chapters that discuss um, the first day back at school uh, fairly interesting because we get a little bit of more of a tidbit of how like the Hogwarts education system really works and what's on the curriculum. And in particular, this chapter made me wonder like, okay, so like are teachers um, responsible for their own curriculum? Like Umbridge is you know, debated, like, she's like, yep, you're just going to read the theory and that's all. And, you know, no practice. Because if you read the theory well enough, then you should have no problem with the practice when it comes to your owls. And like, Trelawney's like, let's talk about dreams and decoding those dreams and like what that means. And then there's that line that talks about Professor Ben's, like, w- that the, the subject matter would have been far more interesting had it been another teacher. Um, so, so the idea not only being of like, well, the curriculum is this and it's set by, it might be set by the teachers, but also that, you know, not all teachers are created equal. No, but also too, saying this as a teacher um, and one who is currently struggling to make things imaginative and original and engaging and mm-hmm. well-paced in the middle of a global pandemic. You also don't see in this chapter where any of the students are taking any of the classes that they actually like, or even more importantly, because they're being taught by a teacher that they actually engage with. Like, we don't see Professor Sprout. We don't see Professor Flitwick. We don't see... They don't have transfiguration in the mm-hmm. we see McGonagall, but we don't we see her as almost just as like a mentor advisor capacity, We're mm-hmm. seeing her as their teacher. We also have what I call a preponderance of Snape, which is not the best also a teacher, as as you know, reflecting what you said, Alex. Mm-hmm. As a teacher who also realizes that you definitely have to train your students to be prepared for the test that might determine their future or might not. And you also fight against the indoctrination that the test is not important as a kid told me about the PSAT today. But yet when I asked him what he was going to do, that was the alternative from college. He didn't have an answer for me. Um, I don't ever want to go on recording saying that I relate to Snape. <laughs> well, I, I will say it. Um, when I was a teacher, like, I could totally see why Snape was that way. Like, because, <laughs> you know, like, sometimes kids are annoying. And, like, you know, I was a 22-year-old teacher. Like, <laughs> I was barely a- conscious of my own. Yeah. And and, that, and it, I think it's, like, totally valid to think that as long as, you know, and I know that neither of you would ever do this, but as long as you don't ever cross that line from, you know, being strict and stern with your students to, you know, mocking their physical appearance or threatening to kill their pets, 
There are just lines that as long as you don't cross, you're not snake. Yeah. I mean, yeah, did not do that. <laughs> but was definitely like a little snippy with the kids and was like, like they would try to bait me with mocks or whatever. And sometimes I would return in kind. Not my best or finest moment, I no. will say. And I think we, people expect teachers to be, to be like, the more like the Mag- perfect have yeah. the moral high ground <laughs> the moral high ground and the but also to like I have been like Snape in the moment where I have given my students an impossible assignment to show them that I wasn't to show them like they weren't the geniuses that they thought they were mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but on the other hand it was like okay like now that you've gotten the message, I'm actually going to show you how to do this, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, it's funny because when I was a teacher, I was like that teacher that could silence students with a look. Mm-hmm. Um, and my assistant principal was like, if you looked at me the way that you looked at that kid right now, I would be peeing in my pants. And I was like, yeah, I don't know what face I made. Like, I'm sorry. Um, but these kids need to, like, learn respect and I didn't like abuse them or whatever I just like was stern and but but I did sometimes when I we're I'm reading like Snape chapters I'm like this is why I don't teach anymore because like I could totally see myself becoming this asshole of a person and I don't like that about myself yeah I'm always on the precipice of depending on who you ask is Miss Mills the asshole could be a a myriad of answers. I mean, let's be real. There's people out there in the world who think I'm an asshole anyway, regardless whether I teach or not. On a good day, I'm badass Professor McGonagall. On a bad, bad, very bad day, I can lean more towards Snape and not just because I have oily hair. Like, we all contain multitudes, is what I'm saying. Yeah, that's true. But none of you are like Umbridge, right? I mean, no, that's just JK. No, I'm never... I, the only way that I'm going to tell my kid, oh, my kid, Lord, <laughs> I I consider them mine in some way. Yeah. You tell them that I will deny it vehemently. <laughs> I hope they don't listen to this podcast. Ooh, Miss Mills cussing. <laughs> the only time that I tell my kid that they're a liar is when they told a lie. Incessantly. Like... You're like, okay, kid, you're lying. Yeah, but don't, I mean, just playing devil's advocate, just playing devil's advocate here because I don't believe this at all. But what, like, don't you think that Umbridge believed that it was a lie? No, no, absolutely not. Somebody, some, if she, if she believed, if she truly believed it was a lie, it was self protection based on her blind loyalty to power that is the Ministry of Magic. Yeah. And I guess, like, if, if Fudge told her it's a lie and she believes Fudge, so it's like it's like Trump supporters, right? Yeah, it's like, it's like Kellyanne Conway. Like, that's yeah. the umbrage of our administration. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think it's about the fact that you don't know the truth because those types of people are not ignorant of the truth. It's the fact that they get a rise out of being defiant against the people that know the truth. Yeah, well, also, it gives them more power to to uh, obfuscate the truth. You yeah. Know? Like, like it, it helps them be in power still to deny the truth. Because if they deny that Voldemort is back, right? Like, that helps them hold on to whatever little vestiges of power they still have in the ministry. Yeah. And in the wizarding world. And she now gets... A, an inside look to see this this wasn't just about planting some a ministry worker within Hogwarts mm-hmm. curriculum this was literally spying on Harry to see who believes him and who doesn't and she and not just spying but also like in like like colonizing via education but she she says it she says if someone is alarming you with fibs about reborn dark wizards, I would like to hear about it. Yep. Here to help. I am your friend. Yeah, that was scary. 
Go yes, ahead. and through that, not only is she spying and subverting the power of truth, but she is also re literally rewriting the story that in a way that makes the ministry look good, which is why I was like struck and thinking, shit, imagine if instead of Defense Against the Dark Arts, she was made like the like the history professor. Like what kind of history would be taught at Hogwarts then? Well, considering the fact that Muggle Studies is a completely separate and different class, obviously history is only about wizards and mm -hmm. again no offense because we see that in in this book like ghosts are are sentient not sentient but like i think they're intelligent beings in this book. yeah they're yeah they're intelligent beings and she lit she lit like professor benz is basically jk taking the mickey at ghosts the fact that Professor Benz is, is slow and old and uh, this droning, like... Oh, a boomer. Yeah, Ben Stein boomer versus nearly nearly headless Nick could teach history of magic and it would be a totally different class. Yeah, but even then, like, Professor Benz is still teaching, like, troll wars or whatever, but I don't think Umbridge would. Is my point. No. Well, if she if she did, she would teach the uh, from a perspective of you know the wizards were always right. The wizards are superior. Yeah. So it's like the lens, like it's not the subject matter; it's the lens through which it's presented. Oh yeah, for sure. And who she can hook into, like you said, who she who she can indoctrinate. Again, Seamus looked half scared, half fascinated. Mm-hmm. And Lavender, too, which I also am like these two characters that are kind of like comedic relief, not really like free thinkers of their own. They're they're always in groups. They're always like leaning this way or that way. Like they're either all the way humorous or all the way irate. There is no middle dynamic thinking ground for them. It's like, OK, mm -hmm. Y'all are easy prey for Umbridge because you can be easily manipulated. Yeah, but then, you know, we'd like to think, oh, that's like an improbable character sketch, right? Like, oh, what a not well-rounded character. But then we know people like that IRL, right? Like oh, yeah. I mean, people are like, like it, there's a reason why con men still run the streets. People are impressionable. And it's not like, oops, the one time, you know, it's like, like y'all be getting duped out here. Like for real. How do you, how do you think Hitler gained, gained power in Germany? Like also Trump, also Keith Ranieri from the like Nexium cult, like who just got 120 years in prison. Yes. Love to see a bad man pay. But anyhow, yeah, people are impressionable and I'm the first one to admit like, I would probably join a cult. I am so glad I I haven't been recruited yet. Unless this podcast is a cult, which would make me the cult leader. I don't know. You said you would be likely to join a cult, not start a yeah, cult. So, so I, think I think we're safe. We're safe. But, we're safe. but like, yeah. honestly, like how <laughs> how lucky that I haven't been recruited by a cult. Yeah, but Give yourself more credit. Come on. It's, but it's also like, it, even though it comes a lot, more diplomatic than constant vigilance. <laughs> <laughs> McGonagall literally tells Harry, like, you gotta watch yourself. Like, yeah. The the fact that she's like literally telling him, like, this is so much bigger than what you think it is. Like, this is no longer about house points and detention, you know? What's so funny is that. Hermione, that is a, like any everything McGonagall says in that last scene is exactly what Hermione has been trying to say. She just says it in a way that actually gets through to Harry. Yeah, which is what good. Well, because and, <laughs> and that's I'm actually you, man. <laughs> but that's actually what good teachers do. Yeah, teachers take the thoughts of others and deliver it in a way that the student can understand. Exactly, which is why we're often like. 
oh my God, there's 30 people in here. I have to deliver this 45 minute lesson in 30 different ways so that each of them walks away like, whoa, wow, I really understood that. Man, being a teacher is more than what people expect. And, you know, nobody's handing us biscuits, to be quite honest. (laughs) Yeah. Do you think, this is off topic slightly, but do you think that the biscuit that that McGonagall gave to Harry or offered to Harry at the end of the chapter was a Girl Scout cookie? Nah, I don't think so. It's a ginger. It's a ginger cookie. Oh, a ginger new. A ginger new. Do they not have any ginger flavored, uh, like gingerbread flavored Girl Scout cookies? They do not. That- it was such an old lady, like, fig Newton call out. Like... <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been thinking, actually, um, side note, I've been thinking about making a ginger biscuit recipe with, like, maybe dark chocolate fudge, because ginger and chocolate go well, do, go very well together. As Sounds to- like Patreon content to me. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> a recipe for um, maybe the month of, say, December. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Festive. Make a ginger newt. Make a ginger newt and make them in the shape of newts. Yes. Y- yes. Um, that is going to be hard for me to do in theory and, and in practice um, <laughs> in, in terms of like cutting it. But we're just going to. I believe in you. We're just going to call them like, you know, biscuits and they're going to be round and everyone's going to love them. If you want to make a newt. Um, version of them. I will also send you like a cutout. You can, you could draw that. You could draw the face of Eddie Redmond on the cookie. You know, I really <laughs> admire that it would. I really be a ginger newt. I, I really <laughs> admire the belief that you have in my artistic abilities and baking abilities, but that's going to be a hard no. She's always trying to fit Newt Scamander in there. So. I might Photoshop him on a picture of the cracker, the cookies. That's good. You could put a sticker of him on the box. And yeah, there we go. Newt we'll call them Ginger Newt Scamanders and it'll be perfect. Hey, th- there's chocolate involved. And that brings us to... Cementers and chocolate. Cementers and chocolate. Heck yeah. Oh, one second, one second. You know what? I might just make K. Alex as as another air horn. Yes, man. Please do. I'm such a joy at parties. (laughs) Love it. I mean, I should know you were with us for a week, almost. Man. Good times. I wasn't there, but I'm sure it was good times. A good time was had by all. I don't know about Kay Alex, but like no, my dog in heaven. I had a wonderful time in Minneapolis is next. Woo! Yes. Well, Helene, why are you coming to visit me? Uh, why aren't you coming to visit me, Missy? Uh, cause like you know, I, I can't be far away from my children. Me neither. I don't <laughs> making any I don't hear anybody making any Michigan plans. Oh, oh girl, I go to Michigan when, when COVID is gone and done with. I, I go to Michigan at least once or twice a year, and I will 100% make sure to see you whenever I go. All right. So, so. like, the plan is... Look at us strategizing. Well, also, we said Puerto Rico at some point. I told you, my parents are, lo- like, they will love to host us. Are they, like, already looking forward to it? They're yes. like, when are, when yeah. are Helene and Calix coming? Okay, no, good. there's, like... When are you bringing your friends? Like, come on. <laughs> Guys, wear your fucking mask so I can go to Puerto Rico. <laughs> exactly. Everyone, wear your masks. I miss my parents. And also, we need to, like, party it up in the island. <laughs> I am so already there. I'll, I'm actually already there. You guys are just slacking because you're not there yet. Because well, I'm there. I'm always spiritually there. You know that. <laughs> I'm... I, I am, as my husband calls it, an island goth sometimes, like when I'm wearing like all black. It's like, oh, tropical goth. What a, what a perfect what a perfect transition. You know what else is a goth? A dementor. <gasps> a dementor! <laughs> but they're not <laughs> tropical. I'm no, no. with pina coladas. Hey Alex, what is what is your goth dementor in this chapter? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> my, uh, my dementors are actually it's like prepubescent goth <laughs> preteen <No>. goth <laughs> Hermione and Ron still finding every little way to make this about themselves. They know what Harry's, they quote unquote know what Harry's going through. They quote unquote are on his side and yet every little thing turns into them making it about them. You know what that's called, (laughs) K-Alex? That's called sexual tension. No, no it's not. (laughs) No, it's not. <laughs> I, I felt that like laugh in my like gut. Ah. Go, go away, Muggle Cast. <laughs> no, I, I actually got kind of annoyed with them, especially after they were like they kind of gaslit Harry into like feeling bad for getting mad at them about fighting all the time. Yeah, it absolutely, absolutely. To where he was like annoyed and ashamed, and I'm like, why are you so annoyed like, when they're the it's like being it's low key order of the phoenix, like the politics of gaslighting, Harry? Because this is all we've talked about, <laughs> like for like four episodes. This is what I'm trying to tell y'all. I've been having the best politics right now. Like, yeah, no, I mean, he Harry is con- consistently gaslit throughout this entire book, and it's very disappointing and very sad and saddening to me. And I just feel for my boy, and especially with Hermione and Ron fighting. I was you like, know yeah, what, dude, like- stop, don't make him feel bad for getting mad at you about fighting. Just stop fighting, weirdo. And he's a he's apologized like twice already. And, but you keep fighting and you keep finding ways to insert yourself into Harry's feelings. And it's like, go away. Like, even if you were meant to be together, which by the way, you're not, do it on your own time. (laughs) Like, are you, um, as the kids say, reclaiming your time, K. Alex? I am. I'm reclaiming my Hermione and Ron time. I really shouldn't even have Hermione and Ron time. <laughs> like, that shouldn't even be a take that we should be discussing. But, but here we are. We, it, it's like, bruh. Okay, speaking yeah. of things we shouldn't be discussing because they're so terrible and sad, Helene, what is your Dementor? I tried to think of like some nice, eloquent like meaningful deep dementor in this chapter and literally all I came up with was umbrage like not even like a specific thing that she does it's just literally her in this entire chapter like every second that she appears on the page or speaks anything out of her mouth it just makes my entire body tense up and I'm like oh I just want to get rid of her (laughs) Some people's some people's whole aesthetic is a dementor. <laughs> you know, like she's just a pink dementor, but that doesn't make her any less of one. Yeah, she is going around sucking souls out of people. She is. Speaking of Umbridge, my dementor is a little bit um, more theoretical, I would say, all pun intended. Like, the very idea that she spews, that theory, is just as good as practicing something. Like, imagine for a second, if you will, if the gall of someone telling you that reading on, say, sex, for instance, is the same thing as actually having sex. Yes, I went there. That is... No, like, you know, one is theory and the other one is practice and they're called different things because they are different things. So I hate to burst your bubble, but Southern Christians have been pushing that ideology for years. No, I'm sorry, Baptists. Move on. Anyhow, like, like, (laughs) just be... That poop, when you say I do, you'll get, you'll automatically just know how to lay the pipe. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) Imagine, like, this is what all the kids in the class are scared of, the fact that she's saying, I'm not going to allow you to practice at all any practical dark or defense against dark arts, but you are going to get tested on a practical execution of what I'm teaching you, but you're never actually going to get to practice it. Like, 
imagine having to imagine Honestly, having to take yeah. a test where you have to give the best sex of your life and all you've done is read about it. And also like not from a reliable source, you know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. Um like, you know, a source that says like, you know, women, they don't feel pleasure. They just lay there and think of England. <laughs> Or, you know, um, they think the purest thoughts and the man does everything. You know, something like that. A clitoris does not And then you're like, oh, no, I am saving myself for marriage. It's going to be beautiful. And then you have terrible sex. And then you're like, oh, shit, is this what I've been waiting for? What is life? And then you turn into a Republican Karen and you vote for Trump. That's what fucking happens. No, 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 no. You're skipping a whole bunch of steps. <laughs> <laughs> you're skipping the part where your 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 guidance, your mentor, your whoever is going to tell you that the reason why <laughs> you're so miserable is because you have not adjusted to the fact that this is your life now. Oh, 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 and, and you I- haven't submitted to your husband properly. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, you haven't gone through all the steps. It, it honestly becoming a Karen is more difficult than brewing the drought of pee. <laughs> and yet, a lot of white women do it. How do they do it? Just accidentally slip it in the cauldron, and poof, you're a Karen. We're giving yeah, we're giving Karens way too much credit for all the quote unquote work they have to do to become a Karen. I feel like the patriarchy does like ninety percent of that already. What? Anyhow, the patriarchy does some work. <laughs> Who do? Uh, patriarchy is they make a... they make minorities do it for them. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's the patriarchy is an automated system that <sighs> makes Karens an automated. Okay, yep, that's a great visual. I'm sorry, <laughs> it is it is what it is. Uh, <laughs> you know, like um, that part in the the vows where there's like you will obey your husband. You know, because I use like we use the supposedly traditional vows, and I forgot about that one vow. I actually repeated the vow before that when that part happened. And everyone was like, no, you have to, like, repeat the other part. And, like, so I had to say that part because I was like, oh, fuck. And, like, I tell Seth all the time, like, God knew I didn't mean it in my heart, so it doesn't count. (laughs) Adri is one of those people who definitely thinks that the bad sex part is about the four worst part. (laughs) It's like... Mm, this- well, no, it, it wasn't the better or worse part that I thought didn't apply. It was the obey part. Oh, yeah, for sure. So I was like, God knew, you know, because every time he reminds me of it, because he's laughing about it, because obviously he understands and he teases me about it. And I was like, but God knows that I didn't mean it. So it doesn't matter. I don't have to obey you. <laughs> you, don't have to him, wasn't- you don't have to obey him anyway. What are you talking about? It doesn't matter if I said the words or not. God knew I didn't mean them. You had your so fingers. Not- you had your fingers crossed behind your back. It's fine. That's, what, that's exactly what I said. And also, it's like <laughs> it's not binding if God knows that I didn't mean them with all my heart. <laughs> but also, you should obey me. Why is that not on the man's vows? Because the patriarchy. Is that even a question? I know. I just wanted to hear you say that. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm curious, K. Alex, because you don't have anything written down for your chocolate in the script. So, did you not have a chocolate this chapter? Are you just are you just keeping it? I did. It? I did. I did. I want to hear it. What is it? <laughs> I don't know what it is, and I'm already laughing. I don't know why. I'm just saying. Okay. I'm still laughing at Adri going down <laughs> to her husband and telling everybody about it. But anyway, <laughs> what? <laughs> Double crossing the patriarchy. <laughs> oh well, I mean, you, you saw us in action. It's not a big secret. I did. Anyway, <laughs> um, I needed that laugh. My girl Angelina Johnson. Of course it is. Yeah, you better give her the horn again. Period, sis. Black girl magic in its entirety. Sis is strategizing about her business. She's like, oh, I'm, look at me. 
I'm the captain now. <laughs> and I love how excited that's, that's a great um, a quote from that uh, movie. Yeah, and I'm I'm I love I love how excited Harry is that she's the captain too. I'm all, I'm like yes, Harry recognizes her badassness. I'm so ha- I'm so here for this. Also, also like Oliver Wood, even though he's a foundational crush in movie form for me, kind of annoying. There, I said it. Now that is a hot take. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not. You nope. know, I find people that are really into sports annoying, and I'm nope. sorry. Nope. No, 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 no. We're not going there because <laughs> what we're not, what we're not gonna do is ignore my chocolate. That is the chocolate deliciousness of Angelina Johnson for Oliver Wood, who. Yes, while he's gone on to Puddlemere United and is being the best keeper he can be, we are focusing on the black woman in the room right now. And she has a strategy. Yeah, I apologize. The patriarchy made me do it. Every everybody has to come to practice on time. And we are gonna have a tryout because you don't get to skate around. And the team is going to be better than ever because a feminist, a black feminist, is in fucking charge. An icon. Yeah. An icon. We love to see it. How many shots have people taken at this point? Probably like seven or eight at this point. Probably more. Let's I mean, if, if we're going to keep talking about Angelita, people might as well raise a glass and take a couple shots because... Y'all know how I feel about her. She doesn't get enough shine. She just doesn't. And the fact that she finally gets what she should have gotten in Goblet of Fire, which was being a fucking champion. Recognition! Now that's a fucking hot take. I mean, I love Cedric, but I would have definitely wanted to see her over Cedric at some point. I would love to have seen that story. Would not love to see her die though. No, no, not not dying at the end. Definitely no, not dying I'm, at the end. But like the the other Hogwarts no, tra- I'm, champion. I'm is gonna what I tell meant, you sure. the way that I told everybody else, JK wouldn't have tried it. She's not about that life. She wouldn't have killed Angelina. And I know that for a fact. I well, good. Down in my very, very soul. Well, good to know that she's a turf, but she wouldn't have killed Angelina. No, because I would have been up her butt forever. <laughs> forever. It's good that she didn't do it for sure. I mean, that's one thing we can count towards her, I guess. Wow. We're, we're out there just giving out like small <laughs> platitudes to white women. Anyhow, <laughs> what's uh, speaking of white women, Helene, what's your child? Oh, that's me. So, that's me. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> white women coming in to give praise to the white man, or I guess we don't exactly <laughs> know his, his ethnicity. People do think that Harry could be half Indian. It's very possible. Um, but my chocolate is Harry not taking shit from anyone in this chapter and standing up to Umbridge without a moment's hesitation. I love it. He doesn't even question whether or not, like, he, he doesn't hesitate. He's just like, this girl is spouting lies. I have to stand up for Cedric's memory. I have to stand up for the truth. And I'm going to do it no matter what the consequences are. <laughs> I just had to. <laughs> you know what? I... I truly appreciate that. The only thing that I wish Harry was a little bit more forthwith about is giving folks them hands. <laughs> like I, I just, I just feel like having lived with Dudley all of my life, I would have learned how to fight. I would have learned. But I, I think Harry's really good at like ducking the fight, though. And I think that he probably learned from living with Dudley that violence is not always the answer. Aww. Sometimes it's better. Sometimes it's it's more powerful to fight someone with your words than with your fists. Oh, the more you know. <laughs> we need an anti horn. You got to come up with a sound that's like boo hiss. What? I'm a pacifist. What do you want from me? 
You're at a Hufflepuff. Oh, you know, Cleo's uh, growling over here. I, 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 I definitely heard the growling in my ear. I heard that 100%. Cleo is like, a, Cleo's Cleo just like, a, you know, she's not a pacifist. Oh, yeah, she's getting angry. <laughs> you know what she does? She growls when she wants attention, and I don't know how to break her of that habit. <laughs> no, she, oh, man, she got that. She got that so bad. Oh, man. My week with them dogs was perfection, <laughs> though. I wouldn't have it any Yeah, other she way. had to, like, you know, share blankets and stuff. Uh, my chocolate is the queen, the MVP, most valuable professor, Minerva. McGonagall. <laughs> Anyhow, Minerva McGonagall being like a badass queen and like being like, Harry, this is gonna suck for you, but I got your back. But also be smart, you know? What a beautiful woman. What an icon. She also. Very subtly told him, you not you, will you hungry? Well, she was like, you know, have, like, really have a biscuit is like, you know, have a cookie. I hate Umbridge. You did a good job, man. Like, you know, like, rewarding behavior that is not becoming. Not the first biscuit, the second biscuit. The second biscuit that happens at the end of the <laughs> chapter. Well, she's like, have another biscuit. And he's like, no, thanks. So she's like, don't be ridiculous. You need this. <laughs> and he took it. I love and how like, he will literally do anything she says. He's like, oh, I'm not hungry. Take a biscuit, Potter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Last week, we posed the following question. Have you grown as a person since you were 11? And what those changes have led you to being in a different house today? Ooh. We got some really awesome responses. Culture Spoon said, oh my God, yes, I have. I was definitely on a Hufflepuff slash Ravenclaw path. Now I'm a self-accepting Slytherin. Chrissy Archer said, I'm definitely still mostly Hufflepuff, but try very hard to bring out my inner Slytherin. That sounds more like a secondary house trait, don't you think, you guys? Yeah, I mean, secondary houses are definitely a thing to consider, although... The sorting hat doesn't really take that into account. So. I mean, the sorting yeah. hat has like really just hard decisions to make, you guys. I feel like, too, like at this point, if people feel like they're moving from one culture shift to another, I'm like, more power to them, you know? Yeah, that shows but, growth. Yeah. Grant, granted, my dark account is still sitting somewhere untouched, but it's. Definitely not Ravenclaw. I can tell you that much. Mm -hmm. Nisrin Black's response, we've got, uh, well, I'm a Raverin, and I think I'm more ambitious now, but I still value uh, Ravenclaw's beliefs. So that's interesting. I like that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I also like the name Ravenrin. I might adopt that. I like that, Yes. Um, this allow Camino podcast says yes a thousand times yes. This is a conversation we also had on our podcast. Ooh, plug there, shameless. But the major problem, mm -hmm. at least in our opinion, is not only that they sort and therefore define a label kids at the age of eleven. It's how they force separation and competition. We never see students from different houses in the common rooms, and the common rooms themselves are hidden and secured by passwords, so students from different houses won't be able to come in if they chose to. My thoughts always go to the Patil twins, who are sisters attending the, a boarding school together, but basically don't have any space in the castle to interact. Classes are not for interacting, and meals are eaten in specific house tables. I had never really thought about that before, and I'm surprised that I hadn't thought about that, because there really isn't a place for them to. I mean, like, like maybe Hogsmeade weekends. I was just thinking, weekends, like, or like weekends, or, or like, oh, let's go to the Allery together, like all the common yeah. areas, maybe. It just kind of sucks, because like, if I went to school with my sister and I literally like couldn't find a place or a time to just hang out, like I would love to just go and hang out in the common room with my sister, even if she was in a different house. But they can't do that. You know those kids that have brothers and sisters and you never know that they have brothers and sisters? I was one of those children. Yeah. That's me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, my brother and I have gone to preschool together. We've been in summer camps together. And unless he had to either save me from somebody or I call myself, inserting myself into his business, 
people never knew that we were related. Well, I also think that has a lot to do with gender because I also have a brother. I don't have a sister. And, you know, my I'm, I'm low-key ashamed of my, well, not am, was low-key ashamed of my brother. So I think my brother has been ashamed of me. Well, okay, I, I need to, like, like set the record straight. The reason is because he had the terrible habit of being a... Um, pathological liar so he would lie for no reason and then people would you know come up to me like i heard that you're that you x y and z and i'm like what like no who told you that oh carlos ignacio did what the hell is he talking about so you know that oh that yeah no i was just a nerd and my brother wasn't so Eh. (laughs) but i mean we can't all be perfect you know like the people who aren't nerds um it is what it is. I do see that their their point is really healthy. Everyone on the wiser side of things is saying like, hey, don't be like the founders. Actually, you know, become friends. Actually, you know, like actually unite and come together with things and like Well, it's like it also- it's it's almost like when we were talking about the institution of policing and how like we need to dismantle it because, like, it's rotten to the core. So, like, how do you promote unity in a system like Hogwarts that is, in its foundation, rigged to separate children into houses? Yeah. I And I think, too, there's a difference between healthy competition and just... There's a word for it, but I'm missing it. It's like... Rivalry? Malicious. Yeah, rivalry. Okay. Like unhealthy rivalry yeah. and the houses have been in that unhealthy space for so long that the students don't even recognize like what at this point they don't recognize what getting along could even look like, which also really upset me whenever JKR is using making an example out of how the houses don't get along the houses that are all, most often doing the of, offensive behavior are Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff. Has anyone else noticed that? Well, like, what about, wait, wait, what about Slytherin? I was just saying, I was just thinking the house, like for me, that's like. Well, I'm not talking about like the ideological stuff. I'm just talking about like in school. I feel like the most antagonistic house is um portrayed as being slytherin and their uh rivalry with gryffindor but i might be like having gryffindor glasses i know what you mean when like because ernie mac is really kind of portrayed as this kind of a dickish character (laughs) who is is um like i think her way of showing that hufflepuff is not always the nicest house and in in today's chapter she uses Ravenclaw as the people that are like hovering together and thinking that Harry is like inches away from being a sociopath and like killing them all. And I'm like, really? The house of original free thinking of like critical. And, yeah. And critical thought. I was going to say <laughs> people who can think for themselves and. Yeah. Well, but there's still teenagers too. And- I don't know, man. Like it is, you know. No, but like. She does that in such glaring ways that it's like, you don't want the houses to get along. You're yeah. not making any effort to like... Well, it, it moves her story along. That's literally the only reason. Yeah, it's... The the house rivalry is nothing more than a plot device. Yeah, I mean... But speaking of Ravenclaw, we've got one more answer to go through. Um, at Mo Jackler said, I've always been a nerd Ravenclaw forever. And that speaks to Alex, I think, very well. <laughs> I loved these responses. Thank you guys so much for giving us such great responses to this. And I am so excited to hear you guys give us your thoughts on future questions. Speaking of future questions, what is this week's question? What is... Umbridge's worst quality. Ooh. I feel like that is a slam. No, as soon as I said that was a slam dunk. It's not. It, she, she has layers. Like an onion. Like Shrek. I mean, that's hard because there are so many to choose from. So yeah, I think that's good. I think it's a that's good a one. Perfect question. That is a really great question. 
<laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to end this show for non-patrons by discussing the media we've been consuming. And all I have to say is Ted Lasso on Apple TV+. Plus. It is a warm hug for your life. It's everything. <laughs> we spent like the greater part of two days sorting these characters. And at first I was very reluctant to watch this show because she got so invested, uh, you guys. It was the best thing ever. I was like, I do not need another goofy white man in my life. And yes, turns you did. Out, yes, you did. I did. A, another goofy white man, but this time with a mustache. Yes. And and he gives his Slytherin enemy biscuits. It's the best. <laughs> anyway. Go watch Ted Lasso. That's not even my media, but I'm seconding her recommendation. I haven't really had any time to consume any new media recently. I, I mean, as I've said in probably every single episode, I just work all the dang time. But I am currently rewatching season seven of Buffy with a friend who is seeing it for the first time. Uh, this is probably somewhere between my, uh, for the seventh season specifically, it's probably somewhere between my 10th and 15th time watching it. The show as a whole, oh, uh, probably 20. I'm sure that's a very um, conservative estimate on your part. Oh, yeah. I mean, the show as a whole, I've probably rewatched 20 plus times, but the, I don't watch the seventh season as much um, just because it's so serious and solemn and it's not exactly fun, which is one of the main reasons why I watch the show. So that's mainly what I'm doing when I have any time whatsoever. But I also just finished the third book um, in the Percy Jackson series. Uh, you're kind of hearing my... I don't know, journey throughout reading this series for the first time. But I finished the third book, third book last night. I stayed up till midnight because I was four chapters from the end and I had to finish it. And so I started the fourth book, which is The Battle of the Labyrinth, uh, right before we started recording. I don't think I even got through a full chapter before we had to start recording, but I am very excited to start the third book Ooh. or the fourth book. Ooh, exciting. Okay, Alex, what yeah. about you? It's kind of a combination between media I've been consuming and shameless plugs. The Harry Potter Alliance is doing pretty much like a, a readathon where you can you can run, you can write, or you can read. And so I have chosen to read because if y'all look at me, I'm not much of a runner. It's a it's a reading 10K. And so I've started with a series that Adri gave to me as among her many gifts to me throughout my birthday season, um, the Mysterious Benedict Society, which is about a group of four talented children who are going on this mysterious yet somewhat epic journey together. It's a delightful to, series. Yeah, trying to actually stop uh, the indoctrination of a heinous educational curriculum we'll see where that goes fight and the I'll power <laughs> yeah fight the power all the way and you know if you guys want to check out the hpa the harry potter alliance and join that read run write a thon you should definitely check them out they're a great organization yeah the hpa is awesome oh also my shameless plug uh, visit my Etsy store at neoncastaway.com for all your gifting and bright colored uh, needs. All right, that's it for today's episode. Join us next week to talk about chapter 13 of Order of the Phoenix, which is Detention with Dolores. Also, by the time we record next week's episode, as a reminder, the U.S. presidential election will have just come to an end. We have no idea if we'll know who the next president is by that time, but we implore everyone to do their part and exercise your right to vote for who you want to be leading this country. The future of this country and millions of its citizens is literally in your hands. So let's make sure we are all doing the all that we can to make the world a better place. You can definitely find us places here besides here shouting at you to go vote and <laughs> on all social media platforms at AccioPolitics and at AccioPolitics.com. You can support our podcast by becoming a patron and get physical goodies every three months or for $5 a month at Patreon.com slash AccioPolitics. You can also leave us a voicemail. Exercise your right to have your opinions heard by us by calling our number that is just a voicemail 
915-996-1699 with all your burning thoughts and questions. And if you're feeling shy, you can also just email us at info at Until then, politics managed. Keep safe and keep faith. Good night.